Oncologist, oncologist. I specialize in um, blood cancers, specifically histiocytosis of all types, including ACD, as well as lymphomas. Um, today, my topic is to talk about why research is important. And, you know, it's sort of taking a step back from all that we have been hearing, um, all the things that have been made possible so far in the last 10 years um, have occurred because of research. Um, that happened because you all participated or somebody participated in those research activities. So, um, so we're going to talk about what is research? What is really research? What are the types of research studies? And we'll also look at examples of research studies in our time Chester disease, especially recent examples. And then we'll talk a little bit, little bit about our work in survivorship, which is Exciting to talk about because we are surviving ECD and this is a huge achievement with the new treatments we have. And, and including a little bit about our uh, the National Histiocytic Disorder follow-up study. So what is research? You know, it was a good learning for me as well. We never really sat down and looked up, okay, what is the definition of research? So it's derived from a middle French word, which, which really means to go about seeking. And actually, there is strict definition of research by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office, Office of Research Integrity. In simple words, um, what it means is the research is anything that is conducted with the intention of drawing conclusions. And this is very important. That have some general applicability. So if you, if you do research and um, you get data from a few folks, but that data cannot be applied to broadly to all patients, and so it's, it's very critical that your research uh, is applicable to everybody and it uses a method that can be understood by everyone. So what are research study types? There are, I divided them into three types of studies. So the first one is what we call as basic or translational research, sort of looking at um, blood samples, tissue samples, any biological samples to try to figure out why ACD happens, what are the mutations that are driving it. So that, that's when you know, some of you may be asked to donate blood or other tissue samples as needed for research. And, and I'll give you examples of each of these. The other example is a clinical trial where individuals are assigned to a particular treatment type. And that can be done to figure out how safe a drug is. That's an early phase trial or to figure out how effective the drug is. It's a little bit later phase trial. That can be a single arm trial without any control arm, or it can be multiple arm studies. And the third one, which is actually the most common type of research that's being published in ECD, is the observational or epidemiological studies. In these studies, you don't um, assign a treatment to anybody. They may be getting treatment and you observe them. Um, the study that I'm going to talk about at the end, it's a cohort study um, where we ask people to fill up surveys and you have participated in survey-based studies. There are also registries such as the ECD registry where you can sign up voluntarily. So there are many types of these observational studies where we are, we are not assigning a treatment to you, but we are trying to observe what's happening when you're on treatment or right after diagnosis. So I'll give you some examples. So one of the, you know, and, and one of the important examples in Erdheim Chester disease of a translational study is the study led by Dr. Durham uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering that looked at mutations uh, in a large cohort of Erdheim Chester disease participants with a uh, hundred cases. And as you can see in the pie chart on the right, you know, we, we keep talking about the BRAF V600E mutation, but you can see we were able to find more novel mutations just beyond the most commonly known mutation. And that's important because now we are able to, we have reports of cases being treated by let's say a CSF1R inhibitor and other treat, other targeted agents that Dr. Goh was talking about in his talk. So it's, it just shows that just by testing the tissue for genetic markers, you were able to, we were able to figure out what's driving the disease and how to target it. A classic example of a clinical trial is that led by Dr. Diamond in Kobe Metanip most recently. 
And this trial was a phase two trial. So it's an early phase, did not have many arms, just one arm. And this shows the power even in a rare disease that got covimetinib approved for histocytic neoplasms. And the curve on the, the, the graph on the right, if you bear with me, what it shows is the reduction in the how bright the tumor looks on the PET scan um, compared to baseline. As you can see, almost all of the participants, all the patients, had a reduction in the brightness or the activity or the size of the tumor. So pretty much everybody had a response on that study, close to 90%. So again, shows the power of research again. And the work is not done yet uh, for treatments. As you have heard from others, that treatments uh, such as covimetinib, they are excellent at controlling the disease, but there is a fear that if you stop the drug, the disease may come back. So we still need to find treatments that are tolerable or can and, and can also be given for a short amount of time, possibly. So there, are, this is an exciting time in histiocytosis. As you can see, this is a table that was pulled from clinicaltrials.gov. If you, you can count how many trials are currently ongoing and this does not include a few trials that I am personally aware of that are going to open within the next year uh, in histiocytosis. So it's just giving an example. One of these trials, the Selenexor, the number three, uh, is being the data on three patients is being presented tomorrow. So it's pretty exciting time for treatments of ECD where we are like, no, we are not satisfied at where we are. We want to keep pushing the envelope and we're gonna uh, find even treatments that are better tolerated and the ones that um, hopefully can be given for a limited duration of time. Another key example of observational study from our group um, that um, showed that the classic ECD, as Dr. Zardheim and Chester described, uh, that showed the knee bone involvement is actually uh, it's actually mostly driven by BFE600 mutation. So this is a study in which each of the vertical lines represents one patient from a cohort of 101 individuals with ECD. And basically what we found was, as you can see, the green is BRAF mutated disease. So 75% of individuals with this knee bone involvement, so-called the classical ECD, had BRAF B600 mutation compared with ones who did not have those knee bone involvements, which it was just 14% of BRAF mutations. So it's very important because we could see a case and we uh, we can make an idea. If you look at uh, you know the organ involvement on the left, uh, heart involvement, as was mentioned earlier, is very strongly correlated with the BRAF or BRAF B600 mutation. Just another flavor of observational study. Another thing that's getting more and more uh, attention in histiocytosis now, it's been studied in oncology for a while, is patient reported outcomes. And what does that mean? Where we just, it means that we are just going to you, the patient or the individual with ECD, and asking how are you feeling, how are you doing, what are your health problems that you're struggling with. And that has been shown in other cancer studies to help us better understand the patient's health status. And this is very important because it can improve perceptions of communication and also satisfaction with care and also help us figure out how we can help patients feel better once they're on treatment. Because there are two goals in oncology, as I always say. One is to make our patients live longer. The other is to make them feel better. So we want to understand that feeling part as well through this. The tools that are used to capture these um, PROs or patient reported outcomes are called PRO measures or PROMs. And these are standardized tools. And some of you may have participated in surveys and, and those, those just convert these questions into a form that you can calculate numbers off of. And these, um, you know, and examples of some of the PROs are given on the, in the right. So one of the examples of a study that some of you participated in last year when we were at the same meeting in Rochester was using a promise survey um, using um, and asking health-related quality of life questions. So I wanted to present to you the results of that study from 39 individuals with ECD here. And these results are being presented tomorrow. As you can see at the bottom, these are the various domains of health-related quality of life. That's a term that encompasses physical health, mental health, pain, fatigue, 
and cognitive function and so forth. So as you can see at the bottom, you know, these are the results. And what it shows really is as compared to the baseline, the zero, which is the reference population, um, uh, the general population who does not have histiocytosis, uh, we found in this 39 patient cohort that there was worse uh, physical function, patient reported worse physical function as well as fatigue. So the higher score on fatigue means worse and lower score on physical function uh, means worse physical function. So this is just an example. Although research is important, there are also barriers to participation in research. So this is just the graph on the left is really showing, it's not, not specifically from histiocytosis, but just showing that, of course, most patients in the survey were not offered a clinical trial but of the ones that were offered a clinical trial, only about 50% participated in a clinical trial. And that's just for a therapeutic trial um, and may likely applies to other studies as well. And there are many reasons for why uh, someone would not want to participate in a study. And you know they, they could be listed as burden of time, don't have enough time. Second, also, I think a major one is a lack of trust. What's gonna happen with my data? Why am I being asked these questions? What is going to happen with the results? Third is about concerns of risks with whatever treatments you're gonna get. Am, am I being exper experimented upon and so forth? Am I being randomized to a placebo arm? There's also this cost barrier where individuals who are disadvantaged from a financial aspect, they cannot participate in research, especially if it requires you to go multiple times to the, to the clinic or to the hospital. And of course, the concerns about privacy protection. And there are many strategies that, that people have, researchers have undertaken to improve the participation in research. And some of them are you know, providing incentives for the time, travel reimbursement, giving flexible schedules. Some of the trials used to have um, very frequent visits, lots of blood draws and biopsies, and trying to simplify that schedule so it becomes easier on the participants. And a clear communication um, about the study's risks, benefits, having an opportunity to answer any questions that may have. Cultural competence is a very important aspect as well because you've got to be able to connect and understand the individual in front of you, um, their, their, their as your various aspects of their care, what's important to them before you can enroll them on a study. And it's very important, as has been said before, and this is a classic example, is to engage the community members and the organizations that are the key stakeholders for any of this study. Now, I'm not highlighting uh, you know, the challenges that are there with just from the researcher aspect, competing responsibilities, clinical duties, doing research. You know, I, I have I'm fortunate to have funding um, to, to be able to focus on research as well as take care of patients. And, but funding is another challenge. And you know, ECDGA has been at the forefront, you know, as you heard, um, over $1.2 million granted for funding. And you know, if you look at the NIH website, it's not like there are hundreds of studies being funded in histiocytosis right now. Active studies, if you search on their websites, only two active studies uh, in histiocytosis. But the future is very bright, as has been shown before. This is a study that's being presented tomorrow. Um, and I wanted to provide a highlight um, from our own member of our team, um, Brenda Shukla. Um, and she looked at the rate of publications per year. As you can see, 2013 is when the ECDGA meeting happened. And 2014, the guidelines uh, were published. And thereafter, you can see a continuous increase in the number of publications per year. And I'm pretty sure this is going to keep rising as you go into the future with all your support. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful and with that will make way more advances going forward. So let's talk a little bit about survivorship. What got me interested in survivorship? You know, I, I this was back in clinic where I learned about where I, question, the, the question came to my mind, that I took care of a seven-year-old female. She had ECD involving the brain and bone and found to have a BRAF mutation and started Zalboraf, was on it for four years. She was in complete remission on a PET scan and MRI. And as I've talked to some of you and several of you already, you know, when I asked her, how is she doing? She was not doing well. So we could celebrate the PET scan, the MRI, yes. But she complained of many symptoms such as uh, chronic pain, difficulty sleeping, fatigue, 
She had heart problems. She was dealing with arthritis. So she was not able to walk around much. Um, and, you know, she also had cognitive issues. So that really got, my, got me interested in survivorship. So I looked into who is considered a cancer survivor. So American Cancer Society defines, uh, uses the term cancer survivor to refer to anybody who has ever been diagnosed with cancer, no matter where they are in their journey. And National Cancer Institute actually goes even further to include not only the challenges that are associated with cancer and its treatments, but also the family members, friends, and caregivers as a part of survivorship experience. There are many factors that can affect survivorship. You know, those are factors in the in the red color that you cannot modify. The type of cancer, the type, the what's your age, sex, race, ethnicity. But then there are factors that can be modified, such as what the type of treatments you received, what are the chronic health conditions you have. And a lot of these factors can lead to what we call as morbidity, meaning health problems early on or later on after cancer diagnosis. And those things, as we have learned from other cancer survivorship studies, can lead to mortality in the future. It may not be from the disease itself, the cancer itself, but it can also affect your outcomes down the road. So in ECD, it is critical to talk about survivorship because with treatments of targeted, targeted drugs, we have improved the survival that has resulted in a growing survival population. And the, you know, people may be at risk of chronic health conditions, late mortality from other from those health conditions. They may need extra health care needs. We don't know how to care for this population, and they may have reduced quality of life due to various symptoms uh, that the disease or its treatment uh, poses. So to answer this question, we launched the histiocytic disorder follow-up study in the fall of 2022. And the hope with this is to, to come up with guidelines and to, to counsel patients in the clinic how what to expect once you start treatment in the future. So anybody can participate in this disease, uh, anybody with any of the histiocytosis. Uh, we are focusing on at least two years since diagnosis because we want to capture the healthcare. Initially when you're diagnosed, you're dealing with treatments and so forth. So we want to capture at least two year period after diagnosis. But we also encourage patients, family members of patients who far, passed away from the disease to participate. And um, our team members are here um, to answer any questions about the study. And we do give a gift card for completing the survey that you can do from your home. This is just how the survey is gonna look like, just asking you about your symptoms, your health problems, and so forth. So far, we have 134 folks who have agreed to participate in the study nationally. 75 have completed the survey. Our goal, again, to get back to the point of generalizable results is to get to a, a large sample size. I think it's about time to conduct a very large study about this in ECD, uh, about a th 300 patients. And I need all of your help, and of course the community's help to complete this study. And you can get a lot of good, good data about this. It's just an example from the 22 participants that answered these surveys, just to give you a flavor of the health conditions, ranging from osteoporosis to hypothyroidism to heart problems, as well as these invisible problems. Um, uh, you know, difficulty with jobs, decreased ability to participate in social activities, pain, and anxiety. So overall, the hope is to be able to have a survivorship program that is aimed at reducing this morbidity, these health problems, and late mortality, figure out what are the healthcare needs, and also follow these in individuals with histiocytosis, including ECD, closely to see what are the factors that can improve or worsen the quality of life. So takeaway points are, I would say participation in research is critical uh, to improve outcomes and has been shown uh, early on by our speakers. I think the future of ECD is very bright as we have learned in the last few years. Uh, I think the future trajectory looks great. I do want to empower you all to ask questions. Whenever you're asked to participate in a study, please ask questions. We have a lot of rights. We have we are mandated to, um, to protect your data by our institutional review board. And so ask questions about them. And patient reported outcomes of are, are of increasing interest. Um, you know, so you'll be asked to participate in studies where we ask questions about how you're feeling and doing. And I think improved outcomes in ECD, it necessitates survivorship research. Um, and that's why we are conducting this follow-up study. So with that, I would like to thank you all for whoever has participated in our studies so far, uh, the ECDGA for supporting our study and efforts and uh, everybody uh, in the room who has collaborated with us.
and this is my lab team and you'll see caroline uh, and there and why she there so they have the sir the flyer about uh, the follow-up study and we also have a promise survey that will be handed out to you if you want to fill it up that's the quality of life survey uh, but that's the phone number if you are interested in participating Thank mm -hmm. you.